After marching some distance farther, Cyrus was informed that the ground showed the tracks of about 2,000 horsemen. This was a troop of cavalry sent out by the great king to reconnoiter. They were to discover and report to him the position of Cyrus and were also to burn down all the villages and cornfields on the way so as to prevent his army from getting any food. It was important, therefore, for Cyrus to intercept these horsemen and either kill them or keep them prisoners so as to prevent their returning to the king. At this moment, a Persian of high rank, named Orontes, came forward and offered to undertake their capture. Orontes had already twice proved himself a false friend to Cyrus and had twice been forgiven. He had, however, promised so faithfully on the last occasion to be true for the future that, in spite of his previous history, Cyrus did not now feel suspicious, but agreed to let him take with him the thousand horsemen that he asked for. Everything was in readiness for the start when a barbarian presented himself before Cyrus and delivered into his hands a letter that he had received from Orontes with instructions to obtain the swiftest horses and carry it with all speed to the great king. In the letter, Orontes reminded the king of the services that he had formerly rendered him and added that he was now about to hasten to his side with all the horsemen he could procure. Cyrus immediately caused Orontes to be arrested and sent to summon the most distinguished Persians and Clearchus the Hellene to a meeting in his tent. After informing them of the treachery of Orontes, he said, My friends, I desire your counsel as to the course which in the sight of God and man it will be right for me to pursue with regard to the prisoner, Orontes. He then began to question Orontes. Since our reconciliation at Sardis, he asked, Have I ever in any way wronged you? Orontes was obliged to answer, No. Did you revolt from me to the missions and lay waste my land, so far as you were able? I did. Did you then come to the altar of Artemis and say that you repented of your misdoings? And did you swear that you would in the future be always my friend and helper? I did. Have I since then done you any wrong that you have turned traitor for the third time? You have given me no cause. Do you think that from henceforth you can be to my brother an enemy, but to me a true friend? If I were, you would not trust me. The questioning over, Cyrus turned to the judges and said to them, Thus has Orontes spoken, thus has he done. Speak then, and you first, Clearchus, say what he deserves. My advice, answered Clearchus, is to put this man out of the way, so that we need not have to watch him. The Persians, even the relations of Orontes, concurred in the opinion of Clearchus, and each in turn seized the prisoner by the girdle, which was the Persian manner of pronouncing the sentence of death. Then Orontes was led away through a great crowd of Hellenes and barbarians who had assembled outside the tent of Cyrus, and many of the Persians of lower rank threw themselves on the ground before him, as they had always been accustomed, although the great lord was now a criminal condemned to death. After this, Orontes was never seen again, and no one ever knew by what death he died or where he was buried. It is probable that, according to a practice common in Persia, he was buried alive beneath the tent to which he had been taken. After three more days of marching, there arrived at the camp of Cyrus some deserters who informed him that the king's army was close at hand. He could hardly have been much surprised at the news that Artaxerxes was approaching, the only wonder was that he had tarried so long, for he had heard from Tissaphernes of the revolt of Cyrus in little more than a month from the time that the expedition had set out from Sardis. The king had certainly expected that his brother would find some difficulty in getting through Cilicia, and that Abracamas, with his three hundred thousand men, would do something more to check his progress than merely burning the boats on the Euphrates. But it was now two months since the flight of Abracamas, and yet the king had made no effort to meet the usurper, but had allowed him to penetrate unhindered into the very heart of the empire. Cyrus had now reached the rich province of Babylonia, where the fruitful soil brought forth food in abundance, being watered by the two great rivers Tigris and Euphrates, which in this part of the country flow at a distance of only a few miles apart. The Hellenes thought scorn of a king who could be so indolent and so irresolute, and they said, mockingly, one to another, This is a king who can neither ride, nor drink, nor hunt, nor fight. But Cyrus took a different view of his brother's character, for once, when Clearchus asked him, Do you think, Cyrus, that your brother will fight at all? He answered, By Zeus, he will. If he be the son of Darius and Parasatus, and my brother, I shall not get the crown from him without a struggle. 
When the news of the king's approach reached Cyrus, it was already past midnight, but nevertheless he at once held a review of his whole force, for he thought that a battle might now take place at any time. After the review, Cyrus addressed the Hellene officers. Men of Hellas, he said, it is not from any scarcity of troops of my own that I have brought you hither, but because I know that you are braver and stronger than a whole multitude of barbarians. See that you prove yourselves worthy of the freedom that you enjoy. Believe me when I say that I envy you this, and would willingly part with all my treasures to purchase it, and even with far more precious possessions. The barbarians trust to their overwhelming numbers and to the deafening clamor with which they charge, but, if you resist them bravely, you will find them, it shames me to say so, nothing but a cowardly mob. Bear yourselves bravely, and, if I conquer, I will send you back to your homes with such treasures as will make you envied by all your friends. Yet I hope that many of you will prefer to remain in my service, instead of returning to Hellas. When Cyrus had ended his speech, a Hellene from the island of Samos answered him, saying, There are many of us, Cyrus, who think that it is all very well in the hour of danger to promise mountains of gold, but that, when the danger is past, you may forget your promises, or it may not perhaps be in your power to fulfill them. The empire of my father, said Cyrus, stretches northwards to the regions where men cannot live because of the cold, and southwards to the regions where men cannot live because of the heat and all the countries that lie between are governed by the friends of my brother. If we conquer, I will set my friends over all that land. I have less fear that I shall not have enough gifts with which to reward my friends than that I shall not have enough friends on whom to bestow my gifts. To each of you, moreover, ye officers of the Hellenes, I will give, in remembrance of this campaign, a crown of gold. The rest of the soldiers quickly heard of the dazzling prospects held out by Cyrus, and there was not a man among them who did not long for the battle to begin. At the same time, the officers were anxious that Cyrus should not expose himself, for everything depended on his escaping unhurt, and they urged him to take up a safe position behind the cavalry. But Cyrus would not hear of such a thing, and in this he was perfectly right. In our days, the general is regarded as the head of the army who has to think for all, and he would be blamed if he were to risk his life without actual necessity. But in the time of Cyrus, the general in command always took his share of the actual fighting and would have been thought a coward if he had not been seen by friend and foe alike in the forefront of the battle. The next morning, the troops continued their march, drawn up in fighting order, for Cyrus expected that the two armies would meet that day. But as the day wore on and no enemy appeared in sight, he remembered a prophecy that had been made by a Hellene soothsayer, Silenus by name, who ten days before this had sacrificed a heifer and had afterward prophesied that the battle would not take place within the next ten days. The Hellenes believed that, by examining the entrails, that is to say, the heart, the lungs, and the liver of an animal that had been offered in sacrifice, the soothsayer could discover the will of the gods and foretell the fate of the person for whom the animal had been sacrificed. Cyrus had rejoiced greatly on hearing the prophecy of Silenus, for he said, If my brother does not fight within the next ten days, he will not fight at all. And he had promised the soothsayer that, if his prophecy should come true, he would give him three thousand derricks. This was now the eleventh day, and he sent for Silenus and gave him the promised reward. Another circumstance seemed also to indicate that the king had abandoned all idea of fighting. In the middle of the day, the army came to a newly made trench of enormous size, twenty feet only from the bank of the Euphrates, whose course they were still following. The trench was thirty feet wide and eighteen feet deep and was said to extend for more than forty miles. It had been recently dug by the command of the great king and must have required the toil, night and day, for months, of many thousands of workmen. It seemed certain, therefore, that the enemy would not fail to make the most of a defense that had been prepared at such tremendous cost, and Cyrus approached it with considerable anxiety, for, in the narrow space of twenty feet between the river and the trench, his army would be completely exposed to the arrows and darts of the enemy, whom he expected to find waiting for him on the further side. To his extreme surprise, however, when he reached the dreaded spot, not a soul was to be seen behind the trench, and the army was able to pass it unharmed. There were indeed tracks of men and horses, as if troops had been stationed there, but had retreated. 
Cyrus now became convinced that his brother must have given up all intention of fighting, and he began to look forward to obtaining possession of the throne without a struggle. Hitherto he had been riding on horseback, but now he dismounted and seated himself in his chariot. The army also took its ease and marched carelessly. In order to save themselves the fatigue of carrying their heavy shields in the burning sun, the hoplites took them off and either placed them on the baggage wagons or gave them to their slaves. It was almost time to halt and prepare the midday meal when a scout came riding up at a furious gallop, his horse all covered with foam and heat. Without drawing rein, he dashed through the various groups of soldiers, straight to the presence of Cyrus, but as he passed he shouted aloud, here in Persian, there in Hellene speech, the king comes. The king comes! In a moment, everything was in confusion. The king was said to be approaching with a vast army, prepared for battle, and it was thought that the battle would take place without delay. Cyrus leaped from his chariot, put on his armor, and mounted his horse, giving orders that all should arm themselves in like manner and take their appointed places. The Hellene army under its various officers occupied the right wing, the barbarian army, commanded by Arius, took the left, Cyrus, with his bodyguard of six hundred Persian cavalry, was in the center. The bodyguard were armed with breastplate and helmet, carrying in the left hand a short Hellenic sword, and in the right hand two javelins, their horses were also protected by light armor on the head and breast. Cyrus was armed in like manner, but on his head he had placed, instead of a helmet, the upright tiara, worn only by the great king. It was still some time, however, before the enemy came in sight. Not till the afternoon was their approach announced by immense clouds of white dust, soon displaced by a blackness that overspread the horizon. Presently, as the host came nearer, the long, never-ending lines of spear points began to flash in the sunlight, and by degrees the different groups could be distinguished, advancing nation by nation. In front of all came a hundred and fifty scythe chariots. These were two-wheeled cars with a number of sharp scythes projecting from the axle trees on both sides. They were drawn by a pair of swift horses and driven as fast as possible into the midst of the enemy's ranks that they might cut to pieces everything that crossed their path. Behind the scythe chariots came the royal troops, drawn up in the order in which they were to fight. In the center of the line was the great king surrounded by a guard of six thousand picked horsemen, and close to him floated the standard of his forefathers, a golden eagle with outstretched wings upon a high perch. It was easy enough to see how infinitely greater was the army of the king than that of his brother. Cyrus had twenty scythe chariots, but the king had a hundred and fifty. The army of Cyrus numbered a hundred thousand, besides the Hellene force of thirteen thousand, but the king was said to have with him a million two hundred thousand soldiers. This may have been an exaggeration, but in any case the disproportion was so great that the whole line of Cyrus, although far less deep, extended little beyond the center of the king's line. As the enemy approached, Cyrus rode a little forward and surveyed his own troops and those of his brother. The immense host marshaled against him caused him no alarm, for he felt sure that his Hellenes would be victorious, and, setting spurs to his horse, he galloped down to the right wing, where they were posted, to tell them that the sacrificing priest had just declared the omens to be favorable. As he approached, he heard a sort of murmur passing through the ranks. He asked what it meant and was told that it was the war cry being given for the second time from mouth to mouth. Before entering into an engagement, it was the custom for the general in command to give the war cry, or watchword for the day, to the first soldier in the foremost rank, who immediately passed it on to the man next to him. It was thus passed from man to man through all the ranks, and then, for greater safety, it was returned in like manner from the last to the first. What is the watchword? asked Cyrus. Zeus the Savior and victory was the answer. It is a good omen, cried Cyrus, may it be fulfilled. And with these words he returned to his place in the center of the line. 